Okay. Um, I'm going to make sure you guys understand special census now. All right, so special census. Okay, so special census. Okay. Um, screen. Okay, the special census are located all in the head. Okay. Um, and they are smell, touch, uh, not, not touch, sorry, smell, sight, hearing, taste, and mouth. Okay. Um, all right. So let's talk about the first two. The chemical senses, okay? Uh, taste and smell. Taste and smell are actually the same thing, really. Okay? Um, taste is gustation, smell is olfaction. These receptors are chemoreceptors. From a, from a molecular biology perspective, these two re these receptors are all the same, okay? They respond to chemicals that are dissolved um, around them. And you know, for taste, they're they're dissolved in the saliva. For airborne smells, they're dissolved in the nasal mucosa. But in reality, what we perceive as taste is really about seventy percent smell. Okay, if you think about it, every time your nose is stuffed up and stuff, your food tastes worse, and that's because uh, we we associate a lot of things we process and we think it's taste per se is actually smell okay okay the taste receptors are located on the surface of the tongue um, on taste buds okay um, some are located elsewhere but don't have to worry about those okay so here's the tongue okay first of all your tongue encounters food so there the epithelium here has to be simple squamous epithelium okay but deeper it has these channels, okay, that go in deep, and in these channels are these little taste pores. In the little taste pores are a bunch of little these little sensory hairs that um, pick up the dissolved food. Okay, um, there are five basic qualities of taste: uh, sweet, sour, bitter, uh, salty, and umami. Umami is the taste of meat, it's a meaty flavor, okay? Uh, the taste map, okay, I'm sure you guys probably saw it in your middle school textbooks or even high school textbooks, but that taste map thing is actually not real. Um, you can taste all the different tastes from your tongue, um, no matter where it is, or the back of the tongue or the front of the tongue, okay? All right, uh, so worry about the gustatory pathway. Okay. All right. Smell, okay, works pretty much the same way. Okay, they go through these nerves here and then they travel to the olfactory bulb, which travels to the olfactory tracts, okay. Um, okay. Um, okay. Vision. Uh, vision is a really important sense, so I'll, I'll cover that in the most detail, actually. Um, about 70% of all the, the sensory receptors are in the eyes, okay. So, uh, humans are dominated by our sense of sight, okay? Um, so 70% of all visual sensory receptors are in the eyes, 40% of the whole cerebral cortex is dealing with processing visual information, either first hand or second hand, okay? Um, the anterior one-sixth of the eye is visible, so let's talk about what that is, okay? Um, all this. Okay, the first uh, the first accessory structure I want to cover is conjunctiva. The conjunctiva is just a thin transparent membrane on the surface of the eye, and that's where you get 
pink eye or conjunctivitis. Okay, so that membrane is the conjunctiva. Okay, you peel that thin membrane aside. Okay, um, you get a lacrimal apparatus. Okay, the lacrimal apparatus keeps the surface of the eye moist. Okay, you have the lacrimal gland, um, which then it's a sac. The sac then from the fluid empties into the nasal cavity. Okay, so there is the gland. There's the sac. Okay, and then there's the nasal cavity. The gland. No, so you notice these are actually at opposite corners. Okay, um, this is why you have to blink. Okay, so when you blink. Your eyes takes fluid from the lacrimal sac and wipes it across the eye, which then empties in this tube. Okay, um, and it ultimately enters into your nasal cavity. This is why when you cry and stuff, like you have water coming out your nose. Okay. Okay. Um, the eye muscles will skip. Okay. All right, I know this is all sound extremely, extremely weird. Your eyes do are not responsible for help for seeing for vision. Your brain is responsible for vision. The purpose of the eye is to gather, focus, and process the light into a precise image on the back of the retina. Okay, I know that sounds extremely, extremely weird. Even when I say it, it sounds extremely weird. Okay, okay. Um, the external walls consist of three tunics. The eye is actually considered in embryology to be an outpocketing of the brain. And so the same three layers that protect the brain protect the eye, the same three monitors, the meninges, okay? They're just called different things. Okay, the outer layer is called the fibrous layer. The fibrous layer is the same layer, actually, as the dura monitor. Okay, um, the fibrous layer is made out of two parts, okay? The sclera, which is the white part, and the cornea, which is the clear part, okay? The sclera is the um, tougher part, and it allows for anchoring of the eye muscle. So when your eye muscles pull your eye around and move that, that's actually moving the sclera, okay? Um, the other little thing on there is the uh, scleral venous sinus, okay, and that's that little hole there. Um, the other term for it that you'll see in other textbooks is the canal of Schlem. Okay, I think there are two M's, I might be wrong. Um, okay. And it drains into that little hole. Okay. Okay. And I'll, I'll explain the importance of that part here. Okay, but here is the sclera. Okay, the white part is the sclera. This part right here is the cornea. The cornea is the clear part of the eye. These the part. The purpose of the cornea is to start to focus the image onto the back of the retina. Okay, so light. Okay, uh, one of the things that I will ask you guys to do is understand the way the light actually end, like goes in the eye. The first thing that it hits is the cornea here, okay, and goes through here. Okay, for those of you guys who had LASIK before, LASIK is modified, is cutting away into the cornea, so it changes the projection of the light so it hits the back of the retina. So this is the back of the retina. The whole purpose 
of your eye is to have the image hit that perfectly. Okay? All right. All right. The next thing, uh, the next layer is the vascular layer. The vascular layer has the choroid, okay, um, and the uh, cellular bodies, okay, um, and the iris. Okay, so let's talk about what this layer does. The choroid is dark purple or dark brown. Um, in any case, it's extremely dark, and the whole purpose of this is you want to, first of all, it provides the blood and nutrition for the eye. Secondly, and more importantly, it's really dark, and therefore the light that hits this gets absorbed usually and not reflected. The last thing you want is images reflecting, okay, and, and bouncing around, because if, if, if that, that makes the image unclear. Okay. All right. Um, so it prevents the scattering of light. Okay. The retinoid corresponds to the retinoid and pia monitors of the brain. Okay. All right. So the iris is the colored part of the eye. Okay. The pupil is not actually a thing. It's not a structure, it is a hole. Okay, so that is the pupil. Okay. Okay, uh, the pupillary light reflex. Uh, this is what sometimes I have you guys do in the, in the uh, lab. Um, obviously, you can't do that, but you can do that to you know someone else. Um, you can shine a light in their eye their pupil will shrink, um, and that's because you don't want to burn out your receptors on the back end, okay? Okay, so here's a parasympathetic and sympathetic response to the eye, okay? okay. The retina, okay, is the deepest tunic. It consists of photoreceptor cells, bipolar cells, and ganglion cells. Okay, so let's travel through. So here comes the light, okay? The purpose of the light is to hit, remember, the back of the retina, okay? So the purpose of the light is to hit the back of the retina, okay? Then the information from the back of the retina comes forward, turns, and goes out that way, out the optic nerve, okay? Okay, so here, okay, so the pathway of light, so it comes all the way here, okay, so these little uh, blue and gold things are the photoreceptor cells, they're called rods and cones, okay, and then here are bipolar cells, here are the ganglion cells, okay. Okay. So let's talk about rods and cones. Okay, rods are more sensitive to light than cones are. Okay, um, rods, however, only allow you to see in black and white, and they allow vision in dim light. So um, if you ever, you know, wake up and it's really, really dark around you, where you can barely make things out, you can't tell what color they are, and that's because. Um, and that's because you can't see um, with your cones. And the other way I can show you guys how to not see if you uh, use your rods 
your rods are actually more on the edges of your peripheral vision. And so if I, you take a pen, so you see the red tip here, um, if you put it behind you and you bring it in, okay? Okay, I can still, now I can see it, but I can't tell what color it is. Like if I move it around, I can tell that it's a pen, but it's black and white right here. So I can't really tell what color that is. Okay, um, and you can do it yourself. Like in the very corner of your peripheral vision, it is all cone or it is all rods. Therefore, you can't tell the color. Okay, rods are more sensitive and they respond faster than cones. Than cones do. Okay, and but the other thing about rods is the acuity isn't there. Okay, you know something is there, it's harder to make out what you, what is actually there. Okay, and I'll explain why when I go back to the slides. Okay. Okay, rods. Okay, many of them see one, two, three rods connect to this cell, which connect to this cell. So if I trip any of these three, I see something here. Okay, um, so any of these three will work. Cones only have one. One is attached to one, and one is attached to one. So um, I have to trip this one particular cone to generate any signal in my brain that I'm seeing something. So that happens much less often. So I see, I see easier with my cones, but with my, or I see better with my rods, but more accurately with my cones. Okay, I can perceive color vision and stuff. Okay. Okay, cones um, are, you know, these are cones. Um, the human body has three separate types of chrome uh, cones. They're uh, red, green, and blue. So we can see in RGB, and then we, um, Everything else is a derivative of that, combination of that, okay. Okay, um, the fovea centralis is an area that contains only cones. So let me show you what the fovea centralis is. Okay, that dark spot is the fovea centralis. That is where your vision has yeah, so the most acuity in all codes. Around that, you have the macula lutea. The macula lutea, okay, it's mostly codes. Okay, all right. There's the optic disc. Okay, the optic disc is a blind spot. Okay, so that circle is the optic disc. Okay, do you see how the um, the optic nerve here runs through here? That means this region, there are no uh, photoreceptors. No photoreceptors tells me you're not seeing anything. And you, you're not, they're not picking up any light. That area, that's, that little area is called the optic disc. Okay, and it's actually right in front of the field of view. And the, re, the only reason why you're not too, seeing two black spots in front of you is simply because your brain papers that over. Okay, it tells you, let me explain what that means. Okay. So, uh, I don't want to do this. Okay. Red dot. Oh. Okay. Okay, never mind. Let me see if I can change that. Okay, so I see a big red dot. 
Okay. Now I have a blind spot, right? So we'll make a small little blind spot. Right there. That's my blind spot. Okay. So I can't see anywhere there. But because it knows that this is red here, I'm going to fill this in with red. Since this is red here, I'm going to fill this in with red here. Since this is red around this, I'm going to fill this in with red here, and here, and here, and here, and here. And so what I will eventually see is just this whole thing being red. Okay, but my brain actually maps that, not I actually see that. Okay, so if, for example, I had uh, if this spot wasn't clear, if it was actually, say, blue. I would actually perceive it as red, okay? Because my brain is over overlapping that part of the brain, over that part of the vision, okay? All right, I'll think this, done, okay. Blood supply, we're skipping. Okay, now the fluids, okay? So um, there are two types of fluid in the eye, the vitreous humor and aqueous humor, okay? The vitreous humor is in the back of the eye, okay? So this fluid here is vitreous humor, okay? In the posterior segment of the eye, okay? So if light was passing through, Okay, I would hit this. I would go through this thing, which is called the aqueous humor. I would go through the lens, and then I would go through the vitreous humor to the back of the eye, to the retina. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, the anterior segment is filled with aqueous humor. Aqueous humor, unlike vitreous humor, is not permanent. So, uh, vitreous humor, we make it and then we leave it and it stays there forever. Uh, you all know what vitreous humor is. If you ever watch horror movies where they squish an eyeball, the, the squishy stuff that comes like out of it, that is a vitreous humor. Okay? Uh, the aqueous humor is constantly being made, okay? It's derived from blood, and so it flows, okay? And supplies nutrients to the lens and cornea. The lens and cornea do not have any blood vessels because if they have blood vessels, then we would actually see them in our view. Uh, so the lens and cornea have no blood vessels, okay? So they have to get their nutrients from the aqueous humor, okay? Where the aqueous humor goes, it goes into the strain called the canal schlem and eventually returns to the blood supply, okay? So you constantly make it, it washes over the lens and then washes over the cornea and then into that hole. Okay. All right. So the lens is a thick, transparent, biconcave disc. Okay. Its job is to constantly project images onto the back of the retina. Okay. Okay. The light bending structures are called a ref are called a refractory media. The lens, the cornea, and the two humors. Okay. Okay. Um, okay, the way our, our eyes work, this is the way our eyes work, and this is one of the reasons why 
your eyes don't really tell you what you're seeing, your brain does. Because whatever's coming to your eye is flipped backwards and upside down. Okay? It's flipped left and right and it's flipped right side up. Okay? Um, so, like, it, your brain has to unflip it. Okay? Um, the lens is flattened for distant vision. Okay? So, when we're staring off in the distance, the lens is relaxed. When we're actually looking at a computer screen, okay, the lens actually has to constrict. Okay? And that makes it harder and harder to see. Okay? Um, so, um, as you guys start to get older, I'm starting to realize this a little bit now, actually, like, when things are close to you, it's hard to see, um, because you're, as you get older, your lens doesn't, uh, doesn't um, adapt very well. Let's call it adaptation, where, where it focuses down. Um, it doesn't work very well, and therefore, that's what bifocals and stuff are for. Okay. Okay. So, uh, the cerebral cortex is actually responsible for seeing. Okay. Uh, all right. Uh, okay. Um, I want to make sure you guys understand this. Um, what I already tried to explain this once when we were talking about um, the uh, optic chiasm or chiasma, but basically all the stuff on the right eye, I want to process on the left side of my brain, okay? So everything from my right side, whether I get it from my right eye or left eye, I want to process it on the left side of my brain. So the only way to get stuff from right side, right eye to the left side of my brain is to cross the optic chiasm. And the same thing for the left side, okay? Okay. All right. Uh, the ear. Okay. Uh, the ear is a receptor organ for hearing and equilibrium. Okay. Um, the outer ear uh, functions in hearing as well as the middle ear. The internal ear functions in both hearing and equilibrium. Okay. So outer ear, auricle or penia. This tube is the acoustic, external acoustic meatus. Okay. Uh, so sorry. Uh, the pathway of sound. This will go in this way, go through the external acoustic meatus, vibrate this thing called the tympanic membrane, vibrate these three bones, and then go all the way into your inner ear. Okay. All right. Um, the, uh, the pharyngeal tympanic tube is right here, okay? Connects your middle ear to your throat. Um, so if you get fluid inside your ear, uh, it eventually drains into your throat, okay? The other thing important of this is diseases can easily go from, like, your throat into your middle ear because they can travel up the tube, okay? All right. So here are the three little ossicles. You have to know them, okay? The hammer, anvil, and stirrup. So malleus, incus, apes. Either format is correct, okay? Okay. So. Now we're all talking about um, the inner ear. Okay, the inner ear consists of three parts, the semicircular canal, um, the vestibule, and the cochlea. Okay, the cochlea is responsible for vision, or not vision, hearing. Okay, 
your semicircular canals are for rotational equilibrium, okay? And your vestibule is your stationary equilibrium organ, okay? Okay, so let's talk about, okay, so make sure you understand this, okay? Okay. Uh, the cochlea. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to deal with hearing first and then we'll talk about the rest of it later. Okay. So this is a cochlea. Okay. The cochlea, see how it looks like a snail shell? If I unwind the snail shell, it looks like that. Okay. And I have little hairs here. All these little hairs are slightly different lengths, okay? And when a vibration comes in, when a sound comes in, it will vibrate one of those hairs. And whichever hair it vibrates will tell you what the pitch of the sound is. How much it vibrates will tell you what how loud that sound is, okay? Okay, so now we, we're looking at equilibrium, okay? Inside your vestibule, you have the macula, okay, this is inside of the macula or, or uh, <clears throat> okay? Um, you have a unicole and a saccule. Um, each of them have macula, inside the macula, it looks like this. You have a whole bunch of odo lift, odo, ear, uh, lift, uh, bone, or calcium deposit, actually, like their actual calcium. Um, these little things, okay, actually are subject to gravity. So if you lean for, and they deal with static equilibrium, so if you lean forward, the gravity pulls these rocks down and they pull on these little receptors, and the receptors bend in one direction, and that tells you your head is tilted down. If they bend in the opposite direction, it means my head is tilted up, okay? <clears throat> okay. The semicircular canals, okay? You have three of them. One, two, three. Those are the semicircular canals. What they control is rotational equilibrium, how fast you're spinning in any of the three directions, either X, Y, Y, Z, or Z, X, okay? Um, and they all have little ambulas here. When you start spinning, the flow of the endolymph initially is in the opposite direction because it takes time to catch up. And once it catches up, okay, you're fine until you want to slow down. When you want to slow down, your endolymph is still moving in that direction for a while, okay? Okay, this is why um, some of us are actually bad at um, with equilibrium and stuff, okay? Um, okay, so uh, your equilibrium is controlled that way. So, um, a lot of you guys heard of either seasickness or motion sickness. What motion sickness is, um, is what happens when you, uh, when you have two senses that collide, your sense of vision and um, your sense of balance, okay? Uh, one of you guys asked if, you know, you, you know, if I play Call of Duty, and the answer is no. And the, the reason because I get motion sickness, okay? So when I'm playing Call of Duty, my vision is telling me I'm running around shooting bad guys or whatever the hell I'm shooting. My sense of balance is telling me that I'm not going anywhere, I'm not moving at all. Those two clashes, those two things collide and it makes things all wonky, 
same for like seasickness. You, your vision is telling you to go, you're kind of staring out into the ocean. You're not really moving, but your feet are constantly moving up and down and that influences your balance and that throws you off and therefore seasickness, okay? All right, so I'll skip the rest of this stuff, okay? Um, oh, I forgot the deafness. I don't know why I did that. Okay, there are two types of deafness, conduction deafness, sensory neural deafness. Conduction deafness is a blockage of the tube, okay? Like earwax, like blocking your ear, or ossification of the little ear bones. The vibration isn't getting through. Sensory neural, the vibration is getting through. You just can't process it, okay? All right. Thank you.